Hello, my name is Lauren, and welcome to the Theoretical YouTube channel, the only place dumb enough to bring up both religion and Disney debates on the internet. But hey guys, we can all get along, right? It's not like we're gonna talk about anything like it's better than anything else. I just wanted to discuss something that I found surprising, that's all. And seriously, I don't mean to offend anyone with this video. That's not my goal whatsoever. Okay, are we good? Oh, also before we get started, I should mention that there are major spoilers ahead and you have been properly warned. All right, let's get started. So how does Disney use religion? Disney has an interesting track record when it comes to religion. Sometimes it's fine and other times there's room for improvement. But before we can talk about what Disney chooses to represent, we have to first agree on what a religion really is. Personally, I have always had a hard time drawing the line between a philosophy and a religion, but in order to continue, we should have some guidelines to follow. My quick internet search has determined that a religion is the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power such as God or gods. But that seems like a fairly narrow definition, and frankly not quite correct. Buddhism, for instance, is the official fourth largest religion in the world and does not use a belief in any sort of god. Okay, maybe the philosophy definition will give us some more clarity. Philosophy is the study of knowledge, reality, and existence, especially when considered as an academic discipline. Obviously, the academic portion of that statement isn't its only separation from religion, otherwise the world wouldn't have seminary. I personally believe that the difference between religion and philosophy is not what they're saying, but how they're saying it. Philosophy presents itself as a search for truth, while religion tends to say they found it. Now obviously this isn't a black and white situation, and religion is still searching for answers, their PR is just a little different. So how exactly does Disney use this information? Once again, in my opinion, Disney uses religious text and subtext in three distinct ways. To make quick connections, like a shortcut in visual storytelling, in order to appeal to a mass audience who are watching the film, and in order to pay homage to a represented culture. Let's begin with number one, shortcuts. Like I said before, shortcuts are a way of visually communicating information to the audience without having to explain every little detail. For instance, when this polar bear crosses himself in Zootopia, the audience understands that he misses the grandmother and hopes she's in a better place. It's also part of an extended reference to The Godfather, but that's not really my point here. Another example of this comes in The Princess and the Frog when Tiana makes her wish. She clasps her hands and looks to the heavens as she speaks. And while this is not an explicit prayer, it sure comes off that way, and of course it does. What more famous kind of wish is there when you don't have a birthday cake wishing well or turkey carcass nearby? I'd also like to point out the inclusion of ancestors in The Lion King. This spiritual idea didn't really need to be there. No one was going to be upset if they left traditional lion religion out of the film. But it provided a symbol of family, tradition, love, and power in a movie that was predominantly about these themes. Mufasa's godlike appearance to Simba isn't a coincidence. Rather, it's a way of visually communicating awe to the movie's audience. Nearly everyone on Earth believes in, or just frankly understands, what a god is. One that I've never really heard anyone bring up before is the fact that Cinderella has a fairy godmother. Maybe we're all so hung up on that whole fairy part that we miss the Catholic connotation altogether. But it does make perfect sense. A godmother is an important figure in a child's spiritual life. They promise to look after them and help raise them. So having a fairy godmother is just having a magical guardian. One that just happens to share a name with an important religious custom. Some smaller examples include Celtic themes in Brave, Mater asking if the Pope is Catholic, and the portrayal of Chernobog as the devil in Fantasia. Cause I mean, come on, what better way to make a more powerful and hated villain than by making them the literal incarnation of evil who can only be defeated by the hymn Ave Maria. Beata Maria. Moving on to section two, mass audience appeal. Whether we like it or not, Christianity has been the most dominant religion in America since the settlers first outnumbered the Native Americans almost 500 years ago. And while I know that Disney has a worldwide popularity across many countries and peoples, it was founded and still remains based in America. 
and Americans have always been their number one consumers. So therefore, when I say that Disney is trying to appeal to their mass audience, I'm really saying they're trying to resonate with Christian white Americans. And while I know it's not right, it certainly is a reality in our world today, and particularly in our past. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves was the first full-length animation Disney movie. Actually, the first full-length animated movie in general. Yet something that I've never thought about before is that Snow White preys on screen, which made me curious to see what other Disney characters are seen preying on screen, and there's more than I thought there were. Penny prays before bed in The Rescuers, Lilo prays for an angel to be her friend, Geppetto prays for Pinocchio to be a real boy, Hercules drops to his knees in prayer before a statue of Zeus, several characters in Mulan are seen praying before their ancestors, there's a Disney short called Sanjay's Super Team where a father repeatedly attempts to get his son to meditate with him, and Esmeralda sings a whole song about prayer called God Help the Outcasts, in which there's literally a point where everyone in the church raises their arms to a stained glass window of Jesus and asks for angels to bless them. Oh, don't worry, we're gonna talk about Hunchback of Notre Dame in a bit. And out of that long list, some of the ones that really stood out to me were the ones where someone prays before bed, mostly because I haven't actually seen anyone do this. And when I have heard of it, it was always little kids like Lilo and Penny, who I understand, but Snow White's a teenager. She may only be 14, but if the movie's gonna treat her like she's old enough to get married, maybe she's too old for bedtime prayers. Oh, not to even mention Geppetto, who I guess is a source of childhood innocence, but it still seems a little odd. But if you look past the characters who don't fit the perfect picture, you've kind of got Disney telling little girls to get on their knees and pray before bed. Which makes a tad bit of sense when you consider that they might be using this as another visual shortcut. Or maybe this type of quiet reflection is more common than I thought. And if that's the case, then Disney is trying to connect with their audience through experiences that they share. It just so happens that most of their audience doesn't do this anymore. So maybe it's an outdated custom. But marriage isn't. Because marriage is both a legal and religious term. Legally, you need paperwork. Religiously, you need a priest. Now, Disney loves their fairy tale weddings, but I'm only going to talk about the times that we actually saw the ceremony, because that's when we get to see who's officiating. The first actual shown ceremony wasn't until 1961 in 101 Dalmatians when Roger and Anita are married in a church, and therefore by a priest. And after that, we see the loving union between Robin and Maid Marian, Bob and Helen Parr, Carl and Ellie Fredrickson, and Rapunzel and Flynn. Uh, we also see the marriage between Eric and Vanessa and the Little Mermaid, but that one doesn't really count because it didn't finish. And don't you dare bring up the priest from that movie in the comments. It was his knee, okay? So yeah, it would be a little weird to have these ceremonies without a priest, not because these characters are strictly religious or anything, but because the audience expects them there. Many of the audience members have even had weddings, so this little bit of religious practice is less of a message and more of a courtesy. It does provide a link from the film to the real world and can help strengthen the connection that an audience feels with the story. Maybe not such a big detail, but one that spans across so many movies that it's a little bit hard to just ignore. Okay, now we have reached the longest, most touchy part of this video, number three, the homage to culture. So this is where I might get into a little bit of trouble, but it's also where Disney usually misses the mark. Either they didn't respect the culture that they were basing their film in, or they tried and failed miserably. But hey, they don't always screw up, right? I mean, Moana was really well researched and people generally liked what they did with Polynesian culture, I think. And I've never heard anyone complain about the representation of Chinese spirituality in Mulan. I mean, it's not like I actively participate in communities that would have a problem with it, but I, mean, I thought it was respectful. So isn't it a little sad when a movie is deemed relatively fine when people don't complain about how it disrespected their identity and beliefs? But for every reasonably sizable step Disney took in the right direction, once in a while they fell into pit of lava. So in order to break up the scorching heat of rage and disappointment, I'll cut some of the bad examples with good ones. But first, what do I mean when I say that Disney wants to represent the cultures that they place their movies in? And what does that have to do with religion? Well, first of all, it's really hard to separate culture and religion when dealing with traditions around the world. 
We've already mentioned how ceremonies like marriages have significant Christian undertones, especially how they're presented in Disney movies. But things tend to get even more specific when dealing with more obviously religious customs. When a film is based anywhere that actually exists, there has to be a representation of its surroundings. Frozen takes place in Norway, and therefore Arendelle is surrounded by fjords. But Arendelle is not just a representation of the Norwegian country, but of the Norwegian people as well. It would be weird to have a supposedly Scandinavian country populated by predominantly people with darker skin. It just wouldn't look right. In much the same way, it would have been wrong to whitewash movies like Aladdin, Mulan, or Moana. Not only would it be inaccurate to the original fairy tale or story, but it would be disrespectful to the people who are being represented. In the exact same way, characters in these movies must not only resemble their models in looks, but in actions, beliefs, and core values as well. This is a fairly basic concept and pretty much a universal technique. Wouldn't it be weird to outfit a movie that is fundamentally about a traditional belief system with a reoccurring motif of an entirely different culture? Well, apparently Disney did not understand this idea when they produced Hercules in 1997. Hercules is a movie that takes place in Greece, and it's about ancient Greek myths, monsters, heroes, and gods, and yet the entire soundtrack is based off of gospel music? Gospel music first originated in African American churches in the 1800s, combining traditional hymns with African American spirituals. And it has literally nothing to do with Greece. And it's not an accident they used the wrong music, they literally reference gospel in the first song. It may seem impossible, that's the gospel truth. And maybe it shouldn't bother me that much that the music doesn't match the setting, because the music is fantastic but gospel itself is a religious term. Gospel is the good news, and the good news is that Jesus died to save humans from their sins. Jesus, who lived 1200 years after this movie takes place. Maybe people don't make a big deal about this because a very small portion of the world still believes in Hellenic polytheism. But could you imagine if they did this with Aladdin? I mean, people are still a tad upset when the Sultan shouts, Muslims do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and neither did the ancient Greeks. It's not a difficult concept to grasp, and yet Disney entirely missed the mark. How did DreamWorks make a more religiously respectful movie about an ancient figure? But of course this was an example of Disney forgetting to represent the culture that they were aiming for. It gets a whole lot worse when they misrepresent their target. Which brings us to Disney's long battle with trying to represent Native American culture. I am in no way an expert on animism or any of the countless Native American cultures. But I know it doesn't look like this. The first time Disney ever approached the representation of Native Americans was in Peter Pan in 1953. And it was horrible. Like seriously, Disney has come a long way in not being incredibly racist, but they had a long way to go. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out before we got to the next movie in order to provide some perspective. Also, Warner Brothers didn't do much better when they cast Rooney Mara to be Tiger Lily in 2015. Pocahontas came out in 1955 and featured a love story between John Smith and the titular princess. Who wasn't actually a princess in real life and didn't fall in love with John Smith because she was like 12 and he was like 30. But anyway, the story also involves her teaching the ways of her people to him as she explains that everything has a life and a soul, a popular concept in animism. I know every rock and tree and creature has a life, has a spirit, has a name. Animism is probably the oldest system of beliefs known to humankind, and it's still followed around the world. Although it is significantly less popular now. The many examples of the religion have an emphasis on souls, life, balance, dreams, community, and ceremonies. I say examples because no two groups of animists were necessarily alike, but the representation of animism in Pocahontas is weird because sometimes it makes sense and other times it doesn't. Like, the movie can't decide what can talk. You've got Pocahontas' little animal friends who can't speak. And the audience is like, oh, the one Disney movie that's going to show the souls of animals and their connections to humans, but they can't talk? But then we're introduced to Grandmother Willow, who is a talking tree, and we're just supposed to accept both of these scenarios. 
I want some clarity here. It gets even more confusing when they talk about spirits, not because they don't belong in the story, but because they don't do anything. For example, if you compare Pocahontas to Brother Bear, another Disney film, you start to see some issues. Brother Bear also portrays a Native American culture, albeit a different one, and has an emphasis on spirits, souls, and their connections to humans. But we also see the spirits perform incredible feats of glory in scenes where they control the northern lights and transform people into animals. two extremely important pieces of the story that drive the plot. While in Pocahontas, we see the spirits, um, make some swirly patterns in the air. Oh, and they, they blow some leaves. You don't know. The biggest thing they do in the film is actually get Pocahontas and John Smith to magically communicate with each other, which frankly seems like less of a spiritual significance and more of a plot hole. The difference between Brother Bear and Pocahontas' spirits is that Brother Bear would not be the same movie without them. Kenai's journey is a quest that involves shaping his spirituality every step of the way. He has to learn to respect them while making peace with himself and his grief. Pocahontas' journey is a love story that involves bridging the gaps between cultures through opening closed minds. Pocahontas' spirituality was not a necessary or useful addition to her character because it did not affect her decisions. And that is why Pocahontas fails to represent animism. It just wasn't important enough to the characters to matter. Okay, let's talk about a time Disney got it right. Lilo and Stitch came out in 2002 and took place on the Hawaiian island of Kauai. Now, I know you're probably scratching your head right now, racking your brain to try to figure out where Disney slipped some religion past you. And yeah, it's not super obvious. But hula is a tradition that has its roots in a spiritual sense. Like ballet, hula is a dance that tells a story. And oftentimes that story was some of the myths and legends of the Hawaiian culture. Stories of gods and heroes and their relationships to humankind. Lilo and Stitch starts off with the song He Meli no Lilo, which translates to a song for Lilo, referring to the last queen of Hawaii, Queen Lilio Kailani. <laughs> Who, by the way, is also referenced with the song Aloha Oi, as legend has it, she wrote it as a farewell to Hawaii. Anyway, Lilo and Stitch starts off with a traditional Hawaiian song about a traditional Hawaiian figure sung in Hawaiian underneath a traditional Hawaiian dance that communicates a major theme of the movie. <laughs> Flawless. There is literally nothing wrong with the opening of this movie. It communicates the setting, the tone, and the reverence of the film while still characterizing Lilo and the movie's sense of humor. There's a reason this is one of my all-time favorite Disney movies. But the idea of Hula as a religious part of the film is much more apparent in the sequel, Lilo and Stitch 2, Stitch Has a Glitch. Where here, one of the main parts of the plot is that Lilo has entered a Hula contest and she has to perform an original dance. She and Stitch base their dance off of the myth of Hiaka, a story of friendship and the power of love over death. But instead of just mentioning this, the film takes it a step farther and actually connects it to the resolution of the plot. Like Hiaka prayed to bring life back to Lohial, Lilo brings Stitch back as well. So he, Iaka, and Lohial were reunited and are together to this day. Kuikala i ma! Therefore, the sequel incorporates traditional Hawaiian myths into their narrative, therefore creating a respectful representation of their models. Also, this may or may not have been the first movie that made me cry. I was a lot younger then. All right, now that we have talked about a time that Disney did its research and paid its respects, we can look into Princess and the Frog, mainly its representation of voodoo. Voodoo is a real religion. Actually, it's a blanket term for a few religions. It's a combination of Christian, Native American, Islamic, and a few African spiritual ideologies. Voodoo comes in quite a few varieties. Vodun, Louisiana voodoo, Haitian voodoo, and hoodoo are all just a few major examples. Obviously, because of the movie setting in New Orleans, the primary form of voodoo that we're likely seeing here is Louisiana voodoo. But obviously, there's a little bit of blending, because even Dr. Facilier says, I got voodoo, I got hoodoo, I got things I ain't even tried. 
Now, hoodoo and Louisiana voodoo are what Dr. Facelier is using most of the time. The religions involve a heavy emphasis on spirits, like his friends on the other side, and talesmen called grease grease, like the one he uses throughout the film. The other thing about hoodoo is that most people don't believe in it. Like fortune telling and palm reading, it's seen mostly as cheap parlor tricks. This remarkable gentleman has just read my palm. Or this morning's newspaper, sire. Obviously, this movie disagrees. Don't blame me. You can blame my friends on the other side. Another major component of their religion is the idea of voodoo queens, like Mama Odie. So with all of these elements present and accounted for, what exactly do I have to complain about? Well, not actually that much, but let's talk about the concept of good and evil. The Princess and the Frog has a fairly typical spin on the concept as you have brave, hardworking Tiana against greedy, manipulative Dr. Facilier. But in terms of voodoo, Mama Odie is actually Dr. Facilier's opposite. He's described as the Shadow Man and she's bathed in white fabric and light. But what do we actually see Mama Odie do? She uh, dispels some shadows with a stick and, and makes a potion. Wait, no, that was, that was soup. Never mind. On the other hand, we see Dr. Facilier conjure demons and shadows, transform people into animals, manipulate light and space, and predict the future. That's not an equal show of power. Sure, Mama Odie could probably beat Dr. Facilier in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but that doesn't happen. Instead, an uninformed audience member, especially children, are left with the idea that voodoo is an evil practice. And that's not just a problem for Disney. Because as I mentioned before, voodoo is a combination of African spiritual ideas and other religions, which means that throughout history, the prominent practitioners have been African American. This has created a stigma attached to voodoo, primarily because it was created during a time of slavery. Therefore, the economic and racial prejudices that transferred hundreds of years ago, however wrong, are still attached today a problem that is intensified by its negative portrayal by people who aren't the ones being represented. Now, I am grossly oversimplifying this issue, and I'm sorry I'm not more qualified to discuss it further, but in a nutshell, that is my problem with The Princess and the Frog. Okay, one last compliment before we pull out the big guns. I think that the Dila de los Muertos customs were handled very well in Coco. That was a great movie that paid its respects to its audience and its models, and I really liked it. Okay, ready? We're here, guys. Welcome to Disney's most religiously complicated film that they have ever created. The one with belief-based genocide, a song literally about prayer, a villain who's a major religious figure, church bells all the time, and it literally has the name of the world's most famous cathedral in the title. We can finally talk about The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Where do I even start with this one? This movie is the complete collection of everything I've talked about so far. You've got the misrepresentation and the villainization and the pandering to a mass audience, but what I think the issue that this film faced the most was that it made religion scary. Think about it. This was a children's movie made by a family-friendly studio, and it still included this. Like Oh, the opening shots of the film don't look too bad. Oh, Chuck, Quasimodo's mom was just killed because of her religious beliefs. Oh, I really like Clopin and Esmeralda. They seem like good people. Oh my gosh, their entire community just got burned to the ground because of their religious beliefs. Eh, yeah, Frollo was a pretty good villain. Yep, he just burned to a fiery death because of his religious beliefs. Do you see what I mean? In The Princess and the Frog, Dr. Facilier used his voodoo in support of his agenda. In The Hunchback, Religion is Frollo's agenda. The monster in the story is driven by a righteous cause, ridding the world of gypsies. Frollo cannot be separated from his concept of Christianity because he has no other character traits. Everything he does in this movie relates to his faith. He hunts down gypsies because he thinks they aren't holy. He spares Quasimodo because he fears he'll be punished in the afterlife. He feels guilt towards his lust for Esmeralda. He kills in the name of God. 
Frollo is worse than Dr. Facilier because he justifies his actions through God. Dr. Facilier knew he was a bad person. Won't you shake a poor sinner's hand? Frollo has convinced himself he's not. It's not my fault. I'm not to blame. So now the audience is afraid of Christianity. What does the other side have to offer? The Romani or Roma people are in this movie referred to as gypsies, and they represent the other side of the coin. But the audience isn't given any indication that the grass is ever greener. In fact, we are presented with an ultimatum in this film. Either you spend your life hunted down and killed for your religious beliefs and nonconformity, or you hunt others. In addition to not paying full respect to another misrepresented minority culture, Disney has created an unhealthy division. Actually, the film does present one other path. Atheism. Okay, not quite atheism, but at least a non-religious lifestyle. Let's talk about Quasimodo. As the main character of the film, you'd think that Quasimodo would be a fairly religious figure. Raised in a church his entire life and then allying himself with the gypsies, Quasimodo's spiritual journey must be really interesting, right? Actually, it's not, because we never really see him do anything religious. He doesn't even really pray. The closest he came was a song called Heaven's Light, in which he mentions angels, but that's all a metaphor for love. He does not address his statements to God like Esmeralda or Frollo does. Quasimodo merely lives his life in an absence of belief, and he is the hero of our story. Maybe it's not intentional, but the film has presented us with two heated negative options and a single protagonist who does not participate in the debate. In which case, I believe you could argue that The Hunchback of Notre Dame is the least religious film that Disney has ever made. It's a stretch, but the evidence is there. So before I end this extremely long video, I just wanted to connect some dots for Disney. Of the films that didn't really work with their religious tones, there seemed to be one common factor. Which side believed? In Hunchback of Notre Dame, the villain was the most religious character. The same goes for The Princess and the Frog. And in Peter Pan, the negative representation of Native Americans came after they tried to kill the heroes. In Hercules, Hades was a god, and Hercules was mortal most of the time. On the other hand, movies like Lilo and Stitch, Brother Bear, Coco, Frozen, and Mulan all typically portray the good guys as the more religious characters. If there is anything to take away from this video, it is that Disney has a long history with religious representation. Sometimes they hit a bullseye, and sometimes they miss the target entirely, but they have come a long way since the very beginning. <clears throat> Happy Merry Holly Jolly Seasons greetings here. I know people hate Olaf's frozen adventure, but did you realize that it pretty much has the first representation of Judaism in Disney movie history? Before that, the closest they came was TV shows like Phineas and Ferb and Kim Possible, neither of which ever premiered on a silver screen. But hey, if you made it through this really long video, why don't you give us a like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already? You can also find us on Twitter underneath the handle theory underscore central, which I will leave a link to in the description. If you happen to like this kind of content and you want to see more of it on this channel, why don't you tell us about it in the comment section down below and maybe click on these boxes that just appeared. But even if you don't do any of that, I would still like to say thanks for watching and I'll see you later. You're disrespecting me. You're disrespecting my grandmama.